Cool. So um, first of all, I want to thank everyone who's here. Really appreciate you guys sticking out for all the speakers. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about the wonderful world of bees and how they see the world and communicate about it. Um, just a little preface. Uh, Sam Drogi is a guy who takes awesome pictures of bees, and I tried to put as many of them in this slideshow as possible. So if you look in the bottom corner, I tried to put the IDs for all of them. So uh, if you don't take anything away from what I'm saying, at least you can have a new appreciation for the diversity of bees. So uh, I study leafcutter bees and how different ecological restoration decisions affect their populations. Um, but basically, a question that I get asked a lot is, exactly how important are bees? So I thought it would be really fun to take the menu for this place and see what items on here um, rely on bees for different crops and things. So being that this place specializes in mead, this is uh, pretty easy. We lose about half the menu when we take out honeybees as mead's made with honey. But things get a lot more interesting when you factor in all of the other things that go into these drinks, like different berries and lemons and other botanicals. So if we take away all of the other bees that are pollinating crops, we lose just about most of the menu. Unless you're drinking something that's made exclusively with grains and you're drinking straight liquor, chances are you have bees to thank for your drink. So before we get started, I want to give everyone kind of like a crash course in bee biology because bees are really diverse. We have 500 species or even a little more here in Ohio, and they all have really cool things about them. So we can kind of break bees up into two categories. So you have your solitary bees and your social bees. So your social bees are going to be your honeybees and bumblebees, and then basically everything else is solitary. So if we want to break this down into how the hive structure for these look and nest structure looks. For our social bees, we have our female queen that's laying all of the eggs, our sterile workers, and then our drones, which basically have no purpose other than to mate with the queen. And then when we look at solitary bees, <laughs> yeah, when we look at solitary bees, um, each female is making her own nest, and then males have the same purpose with our solitary bees. So looking just at social bees right now, we have our honeybees, which are managed by beekeepers, um, they don't really, they get a lot of help from us, and they are perennial, which means that they overwinter as a hive. These bees will kind of all huddle up together um, during the winter and live off of the honey that they collected during the warm season. Um, we also have bumblebees, which in contrast are annual. At the end of the summer, they will send out a whole bunch of new queens, which will overwinter or kind of hibernate underground, and those will be next year's new colony starters. So, um, solitary bees are very, or, yeah, solitary bees are very diverse. Um, I study the leafcutter bee, which will nest in these little um, hollowed out reeds and stems and otherwise pre-existing cavities in wood. You have the well-known and infamous carpenter bee, which will actually make its own holes in wood. And then a whole bunch of other more specialized things like this longhorn bee, which will nest in the ground. So if anyone here is a huge fan of parasites and parasitoids, you probably realize I left out a pretty awesome group of bees. Um, so one of the most well-known of these is the cuckoo bee, which is one of the only true brood parasites of bees, meaning that um, they'll actually take over entire pre-existing colonies of bees. We have other species for our solitary bees as well. Um, Nomada is a genus that exclusively parasitizes Andrina, which is our mining bees, and they'll lay a few eggs in nests that they find, and then those nests will eat the pollen and nectar provisioned by the other females. Um, another really cool bee is Coleoxys. It's a nest parasite of the genus that I study, Megachylae. So now that we have like a basic idea of our different kinds of bees, we're going to talk a little bit more about flowers. Hopefully you guys aren't tired of hearing about them today. Um, so basically, the Cliff Notes version of this is that uh, bees rely really heavily on flowers, and flowers rely really heavily on bees. Bees are getting their pollen and nectar and food sources from flowers, and then um, uh, uh, flowers are relying on bees for pollination and their reproductive success. So because of this really uh, closely tied relationship between these two uh, groups of organisms, we see really close relationships between them. So I'm going to go through a few examples that kind of demonstrate how closely um, these two species have co-evolved. We have um, a mining bee that specializes on the spring ephemeral spring beauty. It emerges at the same time that this wildflower is blooming, and it's the perfect size to kind of fit right on top of the flower and get pollen and nectar. 
We have another genus of specialist bees, uh, Pepinas or Pepinasis, which is our squash bees. They exclusively pollinate things uh, in the cucurbit family, so squashes, uh, pumpkins, and uh, different melons and things. They're really flat and perfect for kind of sliding down these really deep flowers and um, accessing the nectar that's um, really far into the flower. So this last one's kind of a weird example, but we can look at Coleoxys, which is one of our parasites. Because this one doesn't have to collect pollen and nectar, it doesn't have any of the structures that you see on bees normally for um, holding and collecting pollen. So it looks very streamlined and wasp-like. Um, it doesn't have any hairs for having pollen stick to it or any of like the standard pollen baskets that you'd see on um, most other bees' legs. So, and then one more thing before we get into the really good stuff. Um, just a little bit of bee anatomy. Bees actually have five eyes. These three right on their forehead are simple eyes. Um, and these um, are, they don't really produce an image. They're mostly just light and dark sensors. And they're used for flight stability um, while these bees are flying around. The image that these bees produce are um, from their compound eyes. This is used for their vision. So we could talk about this all day, but um, the compound eye is comprised of tons of facets, and the part that we really care about for this talk is the fact that they have receptors for yellow and green, and then blue, and then ultraviolet, which is super awesome. So while we see in the visible, ra or, uh, visible light spectrum, bees will actually see a whole bunch of stuff that we can't see that are um, uh, in the UV wavelengths of the light spectrum. So this has a whole bunch of really cool implications for this complex relationship that they have with flowers. People have kind of hypothesized about why this happens. Most people think that it's either a combination or one of these, probably a combination of the fact that it'll help bees differentiate flowers when like a really dense field of just a single kind of flower, and then that it helps bees find the parts that they really care about, the nectar and the pollen. So there's a whole bunch of really cool research. This started in like the 70s or 80s when people were actually taking specialized filters for film cameras and trying to layer and reconstruct what a bee would see based on these flowers. And then even nowadays, when you say you have a whole bunch of tomatoes that you need pollinated and you buy a box of bumblebees, they have special like secret UV patterns on the nest entrance to help your bees find um, where their hive is. So. As cool as that is, vision isn't the only thing that bees use to find their flowers. Um, so we've heard a little bit about VOCs today. Bees are really good at picking out certain ones that they care about and kind of comparing their ratios in their head and knowing what they're looking for. So there's been a whole bunch of experiments on this, and we know that bees can remember the certain stimuli that, are, that they receive from different um, scents and that they can even tell different plant species from each other, and not even plant species, but even down to different varieties of the same plant species, just by their aroma. So I um, can talk a little bit about bee communication now. I'll try to spread this out between honeybees, bumblebees, and solitary bees, if you happen to have a favorite. <laughs> so we're going to start off with uh, kind of one of the most ubiquitous uh, honeybee dances. If there's anything in this PowerPoint that you might have heard of, it would probably be this guy, which is the waggle dance. So when I was looking up videos for this, I found a whole bunch of stuff and a whole bunch of people commenting on these videos. Some really interesting stuff, talking about how it's such a complex communication system, how it's really cool that scientists can actually understand this. For, for every one of these comments, you'd get ones like this as well, which, very funny. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of the mental image of a bee coming home after a long day of foraging and then just breaking out into dance. It's a, it's a lot of fun. So to actually talk about the waggle dance a little bit, um, so it's used for bees to tell their sisters as they're returning from the hive uh, where the good flowers are and where they can get the good pollen and nectar. So the dance is comprised of two parts. What you see right now is called the waggle. The bees kind of just shaking around and vibrating really quickly. And the other part of this dance is the return where the bee kind of loops around and goes back to where it started. So the length of this waggle that it's doing is directly correlated with the distance from the hive entrance of the resource that the bee's trying to communicate. And then the angle of the actual waggle tells the angle from the hive entrance to the sun um, and how far off of that the resource that they're trying to find is. So this is really cool and has tons of 
there's been tons of really cool research on it. So the waggler, which is a scientific term that I made up just for this talk, um, <laughs> the waggling bee will produce different volatile compounds to kind of tell other bees, hey, come over here, look, I'm trying to tell you guys something, which is awesome in and of itself. Um, and during like a particularly long waggle dance, the bee will actually adjust the angle of the dance to match the movement of the sun. And this is really cool knowing that this is being done in complete darkness in the hive. And then one of the coolest things is researchers have actually, or have been able to use video analysis software to find the exact points that bees are trying to communicate about by analyzing the distance of this waggle and the um, angle that it's being done at. So there's another kind of bee dance called the round dance. It's pretty similar to the waggle dance, but it doesn't include any information on location. It doesn't have any distances or angles. Most people think of it as kind of a cue to get other bees to forage. So until recently, no one really had an idea, or any idea how bees would choose between the waggle dance and the round dance. But a really cool study recently found that, um, or found a really awesome example of bees kind of resolving conflict with each other and making decisions. So if you see the passenger bee right now is complaining pretty passive aggressively that they should have used the waggle dance and the uh, driver bee is falsely assuring that they know where they're going. <laughs> so all jokes aside, um, the round dance is used for resources that are really close to the hive when the bees should be able to find the flowers themselves just based off of the volatile compounds that they're being released. And they reserve the waggle dance for things that are really far away and when the bees might need a little bit of help to find what they're looking for. So not everyone's entirely sold on the waggle dance. So a few really cool experiments uh, using fake flowers that didn't have any scent but nectar and still ha were like a valid food source for the bee, found that when that bee that foraged on the fake flower returned and tried to communicate where it was to uh, her sisters, um, no one could really find the flower. So people now are starting to believe that the waggle dance kind of helps guide bees in the general right direction, but um, that the flowers are mostly found based off of the volatile organic compounds that are being released. So um, moving away from honeybees, uh, they get enough attention, uh, we could talk a little bit about bumblebees. So pheromones and just like the world of animal behavior and communication. Pheromones are things that are, are volatile compounds that signal communication within a species. So from one species of bumblebee to the same species of bumblebee in this case. People have isolated this thing called putative queen pheromone and it's been one of the hypothesized that this is one of the things that actually decides whether a bee will be a worker bee or a queen bee and how these colonies um, maintain their hive structure. Um, similar compounds like this have been found in other social insects like um, uh, honeybees, wasps, and ants. And then kind of a theme of bee research, not everyone's entirely sold on this either, being the single factor. Other things like food availability and how larvae are treated by workers are um, also uh, thought of as contributing factors to how these bees end up being queens or workers. So I saved the best for last, uh, solitary bees. I'm gonna kind of play out a little scenario um, as if you were a solitary bee. So your males are always going to emerge first generally, and then females will usually emerge second. The males have to find the females to mate somehow, so pretty much in all cases, you're gonna have a pheromone released by the uh, females, which will help the males find them to mate. So everyone kind of knows what happens next. But one of the coolest things with this is that uh, parasit or parasites and predators and parasitoids are able to kind of eavesdrop on these uh, inter or intraspecific pheromones and use them to find their hosts, which is a really gives you kind of the one up when you're trying to uh, predate or parasitize something. Things like this have been documented in tons of different systems. So kind of the standard is the parasite or predator or parasitoid. Uh, trying to track down its host based on just the VOCs that it emits just generally and naturally. Um, Ashley talked a little bit about using the plant or host plants VOCs. Um, this is an example of eavesdropping or eavesdropping 
And there's a whole bunch of other really cool studies uh, which find a whole bunch of really weird cues like um, trying to track the vibrations that different insects make while they're feeding and parasitoids picking up on that. And then even kind of learning what the nest of their um, host looks like and being able to identify that. So before we break for questions, I just want to say I hope you guys all enjoyed uh, these talks today. Hopefully you can take some things you learned and um, just learn a little bit more about nature. These are some cellophane bees that I found today. There was like 200 of them on this west-facing slope on Neil. Um, there's really cool stuff everywhere. You just got to look for it. <laughs>